Welcome back to SuperCloud 3. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante, live in Palo Alto Studios, second day of two great days of Security Plus AI. That's the theme for SuperCloud 3. SuperCloud 4 is coming up in October. Mark your calendar. That's going to be all about AI. This session actually is a lot about AI and security. We're going to find the truth in the data. Joel Inman, who's the CEO of Compute.ai. Check it out, I love the domain name. Joel, great to see you, CUBE alumni. It's been a while, how's things? Thanks for having me, things are great. You know, I just uh, got started coming back into the space after a time away and uh, I, I was able to be uh, reintroduced to Vikram Yoshi, who's the founder of the company and really excited to, to and he was uh, partner to, with him. He was supposed to be here today, couldn't make it, uh, had something going on, really appreciate your, you guys coming on. Yeah, we've been unpacking SuperCloud 3 episodically every quarter. Um, this one's about security and AI. Obviously the data has been a big conversation if you look at the forcing function of this next wave that's coming, the AI certainly over the top is powering a lot of activity in the developer community as well as companies. So security is an operational thing. So data now is continue to inject a forcing function in how people are organizing, how they do cloud and how they do on-premise hybrids and, and certainly with the edge as well. What's your take on super cloud um, as this evolves into the next layer of IT coming? It's it's. It's the same game, new, new variables. What's your view of SuperCloud? Yeah, you know, I think it's really driven by um, people needing to get more out of their data, to get those deep, meaningful insights out of their data. And the demand for analytics uh, is about three, four orders of magnitude what it, what it ever has been before today. And it's just growing. I mean, AI, AI ML is kind of the accelerator on top of that. But if you look at what's happening right now with um, just cloud infrastructure and the need to scale out and support those massive complex workloads. That's where we are today and we're at an inflection point where that demand is only going to get stronger. So, so there may be a security angle here, but, but we were talking off camera about the semantic layer. Um, and we talk all the time about the single version of the truth. It's been like the holy grail in tech forever. Data warehouses didn't do it, MDM didn't do it, you know, lake houses haven't done it. So what is your story around the semantic layer? That's a great question. And kind of that goes to the heart of the founding of Compute AI. Um, you know, data warehouses and, and data lake houses have been a great step forward in kind of building these repositories where we're trying to analyze the data, right? But you need to connect that data. You need to have that tissue across your entire organization in order to go a level deeper and understand what to do with your business. Compute.ai and, and, and what we're doing, our vision for the future is really separating compute from data management. Um, the reason why we've had compute as part of these relational database um, architectures has been it was convenient. Okay, but now the demand for that compute is skyrocketing and having that compute trapped in data silos is no better than having data trapped in data silos uh, because it starts, to, um, it starts to break down. There's not concurrency and the costs kind of get out of control as you start to try to feed the super cloud with um, with that kind of infrastructure. So contextualize this for us, because we've been talking about this the last couple of months, and last couple of decades really. But so we, you, you take Snowflake, what it did. So it separates compute from storage, but it, it doesn't do what you're saying, because you're still putting it all inside of Snowflake. I think I'm inferring. Look at what Databricks did at its recent show, kind of basically building out a, a data mesh um, with its lake house, being able to connect even any data, Snowflake or whatever. Now, of course, Snowflake's also connecting different data types. What's different about your vision? So the difference of separating compute and, and our product is called pure compute, right? Because you really want to get that compute set aside. Um, it, it's building compute into the fabric of your server infrastructure. So we envision uh, a compute engine on every server and interacting the data in a very open and scalable fashion, SQL directly on files. Taking that relational component and then plugging in a compute infrastructure that um, is inherently reliable, that is highly memory efficient, and that is able to scale from a tiny server from one node up to hundreds of nodes, thousands of users. You can hit it with different workloads, you can hit it with ad hoc queries, you can hit it with batch processing, it doesn't go down, it doesn't fail, and the costs are, are linear as they scale. You're just simply 
benefiting from the elasticity of the cloud that you're on. And then I'm gonna have data in different data types, I'm gonna have different query mechanisms, and you're saying you basically, I think, I'm inferring translating it all back into to SQL to make it simple, but, but I'm gonna have vector database, I'm gonna have graph database, I'm gonna have relational, I'm gonna have structured, I'm gonna have unstructured. All those different data elements are today are incoherent. Now I can maybe bring in a, a DBT to KPIify the metrics in a data warehouse, I can maybe do something with that scale, you know, but it's still a, a real heavy lift. Are you, is your vision to, to change that so that all those data elements are coherent and can be joined at scale? Yeah, that's exactly what we're seeing and what we're saying. I mean, uh, um, you said the keyword there, DBT, right? And people are using that authoring tool to um, create their workloads and their pipelines and, and try to knit this data together so when you're, when you're doing that, when you're creating the semantic layer, what you're doing is you're actually executing thousands and hundreds of thousands of joints, right? You're taking tables and formats and rows and columns from all the disparate areas of your business and you're putting them together into one, one semantic layer that is referenceable. And you, know, you said unstructured, it needs to have structure. It needs to have that kind of basic structure of a SQL engine. Uh, not, just not to interrupt the cadence here, but just real quick, define the semantic layer for the folks watching. Good because, question. Yeah. You know, we've heard of semantic web and we see chat GPT. Semantic layer, you guys are referring to a different concept within a data plane. Can you just explain yeah, I mean, what our a semantic view the, layer is? Our view of the semantic layer is simply metadata that connects the different data silos so that you can put it all together. And the use case for that would be, the benefits would be what? The, the use case um, to that would be reaching into all the different aspects of, the, of your business um, and, and really being able to analyze the ephemeral data that um, you, know, you don't have time to put it into a, a data warehouse. You don't have time to run the analytics and the statistics on that because um, if you take the time to actually put it into that data warehouse, it's it, gone. It's, it, it, this is the key point. It's real time and this is why we use Uber as an example. People, places, things, riders, drivers, ETAs, mm -hmm. destinations, prices, you know, transaction data, all different types of data, but to Uber, they're coherent and it's done in real time. They're not shoving it into a data warehouse, analyzing it and pushing back, it, back because out. Because the lag to value is by the time I, the data's working. You never get the ride. Over. It's gone, the moment has passed and you, you, you can't ever get it okay, again. Okay, so this is the problem that you're solving. What's interesting here is if, if the snowflakes and the data bricks of the world don't own that semantic layer, what's going to happen potentially is like what happened to Oracle with BEA. They basically extracted that and the rest of the application world took, took advantage of it. So this semantic layer in terms of, in the context of real time, digital representation of your business is a next wave when you, now you start to bring in AI and there is a security angle here to be able to do this for, for security in real time. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a narrow application in security, but the applications are endless. Well, and there's also an, an open standards uh, implication here too, right? We're seeing a lot of people move to the Iceberg Parquet format, and that's what we support, and, and that kind of needs to be there for the community at large to be able to utilize these types of I mean, You saw that at Databricks. They said, oh, we're going to take, whether it's an Iceberg table or Hootie or, or, or Delta, whatever it is, we're going to translate it into Parquet at you know, the back end, and we'll take care of everything. So the Iceberg standard is emerging, everybody's leaning into it. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Snowflake and Databricks, David, I'd love to get your perspective guys on this. It sounds like this is disruptive to in people who have an incumbent position. Yeah, I think it is. I, I mean, I, I, again, I, I, you know, I think Snowflake is, they have a database mindset. The database guys came out of Oracle. Um, and, and I think they're bringing in people with an application mindset because they want to be the iPhone, the app store, for enterprise data apps, but in order to do that, if they want to serve those real-time applications, they've got to have at least some kind of relationship with the semantic layer, and I, personally, I think they, they need to own it to justify their valuation. I don't know, do you have a thought on this? Yeah, no, I, I, I do. You know, our vision of compute, uh, we believe compute is, is, a, is a new category, okay? People have never really separated it out before. In terms of being disruptive, you know, that's not our goal. We're very collaborative and we want to partner with all of these companies, right? <laughs> you know, so we think we can we fit. We love everybody. Fit, yeah, we love everybody and we can fit right as, in as there. As they lose their share, okay. <laughs> right, um, you know, so I, I, I think that, you know, we're seeing the early days, we're seeing the need, we're seeing people have data warehouses and data lake houses both in their environment. I think actually you, you published a stat 
42% of all customers have both. both. Yeah, yeah. And so that speaks to the need here, which is data is everywhere. It's spilling out, right? And, and how do we make use of it? We, we need to make use of it with a relational structure, a semantic layer, and then the infrastructure to support that. And the infrastructure to support that is going to be the super cloud. So in concept, how could you partner with, uh, with the Snowflake? I don't know if you are thinking about it, but how, how in theory could you partner with a, what is essentially a closed proprietary system like Snowflake? Well, I, I, I want to dodge that question and talk about Spark, <laughs> Presto, and Trino, right? Oh, because great. those are the those are the landscapes, the the, the, so the how, areas that we play. Same in, question right? for Databricks. I mean, with, with the exception of well, there's some propriety in data. Yeah, I mean, as well. so so us, we're a small piece of the system. We're we're kind of think of us as a coprocessor or a compute engine, right? So we we go into that system, and maybe it is a snowflake, and you know, you point DBT directly at our engine, so you ha you offload the compute and you say compute is going to the compute engine, DBT is pointed at, at our product, and then you load it back into your data warehouse. Or I could containerize your stack inside of Snowflake. If, if, if you wanted to develop on top of Snowflake, you could do that with what they've just announced. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the beautiful thing is about the vision is that we believe compute needs to be everywhere. Um, almost like the fabric, uh, like VMware kind of came out in the early days. And so it needs to run almost like an operating system, unattended, you don't think about it, it's just there. And it's going to be at the edge. This is the, I, I have no doubt that the likes of Snowflake and Amazon and all the cloud guys are thinking about this, uh, no question in my mind. It's just unclear to me how they play where the data is, which is everywhere. <laughs> And you're saying compute has to be everywhere. And I also think the compute is going to be an ARM-based processor that's low power, low cost, and incredibly powerful. No? Well, my question on, on, on you guys is, I love the name, by the way, compute.ai, great URL mentioned that at the top. What's the AI aspect of compute? Because we've had a lot of conversations in theCUBE over the um, past, this session as, um, and before, how move the compute to the data, because data egress is kind of expensive and moving around data, but also being smart. So having an AI component, where's the AI in the compute side of your play? That's, that's a great question and, and prepare yourself for a long-winded answer. <laughs> okay, uh, so I'll try to be concise. You yeah, know, it's okay, take your time. Uh, so, so the first part is we, we use AI ML in our product, uh, right? And we use it to um, page to disk elegantly. You know, so within our, 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 our code, we use these algorithms in order to garner memory efficiency that has never been seen before. So bypassing the memory bus throttle that prevents CPUs from being 100% utilized. Um, so if that, if that makes sense to you, we can run CPUs at 100% utilization, even overcommit CPUs, overcommit memory, and have a spill to disk that is very elegant. And so that's where we have the cost efficient piece of our piece of our product, right? Where you're not ever getting oom killed by, by memory overloads and you don't need to over provision memory anymore. So that's number one is we use AI, it's integral to the product that we built. The second piece of our name has to do with providing infrastructure for the next, the AI generation, right? And so you, we've had a decade of data scientists building these AI models and they're ready to go into production. The, the rubber is going to hit the road. Um, and when they do that, they need SQL as the empowering relational engine to put that into practice. And we're right there with them to support that because otherwise if you, if you put uh, an AI workload on top of the current infrastructure where compute is trapped in database silos, you're going to get costs that go through the roof. I mean, there was a study uh, that I read recently from CSET that showed the biggest LLM model is going to cost twenty-five trillion dollars in compute by twenty twenty-six. I don't know if that's still relevant or not. You know, <laughs> but twenty-five <laughs> trillion, right? So McKinsey came out with a study that said, um, you know, we're going to benefit three to four trillion dollars per year in economic value as our our global economy. Well, if you're spending twenty-five trillion and you're benefiting three to four trillion, that math doesn't end up. So something has to be done about the compute and the infrastructure to support AI ML, and that's where we. Play. So to John's point, you're bringing the not only bringing the compute to the data, you're bringing the compute along with the AI and the ML to the data. Well, I, you know, the fact that we're using AI ML within our product itself is is a, a small yeah. piece of the secondary too. So there's a third piece, which is somebody else's AI ML. Somebody else's AI. Look, you have. Uh, I was talking to a customer yesterday, who said we have these models that we've been that we've been building, and they're proprietary to us and we need to be able to run them 
within our platform, and they were using BigQuery from Google. Perfect example of you know, generating and building these models and then putting them on our infrastructure, and they had a serverless infrastructure, and it just works. Um, and so that's the type of example. People are going to have to figure out how do we put our uh, AI ML into production. Yeah, and then apps are coming. What's your vision of how you see the application market developing? Because supercomputing, supercompute, smart compute, AI compute, which you guys have, the super cloud layer, and now you got super applications, how we're going to have data native built in, natively managing the data, and a lot of this ephemeral data will be in the app. He mentions Uber. We'll see more of those apps being coded so a whole developer tsunami is coming as well. So we're seeing a Cambrian explosion of developers getting their hands on these open source. So yeah, Robert's hitting the road for the Gen 1 data scientists with their LLMs and foundation models. Now you're going to have coders coding on top of data natively. Yeah, I mean, I think there's two parts to your, to your question. One, how, do, how are applications evolving and developing? I mean, I think they need to be uh, developed with a semantic layer in mind. Uh, we're really moving towards uh, more of a data-centric uh, ecosystem where applications, <laughs> they, 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 they need to stop being so grabby and they need to share data with everybody and the architecture needs to change a little bit to reference that semantic layer. Yeah. That also corresponds with AIML because what greater way to feed your production workload AIML than with the semantic layer that yeah. reaches into every piece of your business, right? So we're setting the stage, super cloud, is, is, is setting the stage to not only uh, be able to meet the demands of, of increasingly uh, complex workloads from BI tools per se, but also to build the data center that's going to provide support for AI ML. This is why SuperCloud is not just hybrid on-prem to cloud and across cloud, it has to stretch out everywhere. And that's why it is a metaphor for the future of what we call cloud but that, the way we think about cloud as a remote set of services is changing. Yeah. Joel, thank you so much for coming in for SuperCloud 3. SuperCloud 4 is going to be all about AI, which is right up your wheelhouse, compute and AI. I don't think that's those two things are going away anytime soon. I'm glad you flew in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Well, I appreciate you guys having me and uh, you know, hopefully next time Vikram can make an appearance. Yeah, be great. Compute.ai, I mean, again, love the name, love the domain name. Those are two things that are going to be more and more abundant and important. And of course, SuperCloud 4 is coming with all about AI. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. We'll be right back with SuperCloud 3 with Matt Garman from AWS's exclusive video where he shares the master plan for how they will be competing in generative AI. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm.